And now Mike Butcher will be hosting a fireside about investing with Paul Bradgel, managing partner at IO Ventures. Please welcome Mike and Paul. Hey everybody, how you guys doing? Um, so, um, thanks very much for joining us, Paul. The, um, just in case people are not aware of the kinds of things you've done before, um, I mean, it's, I was looking at your career to date, and I think one of the things that struck me was that you're quite unusual for a Silicon Valley investor uh, in that you're interested in the rest of the world, um, which is not very... Silicon Valley. Most of the time, the Silicon Valley guys, you've got they to come and move over here. Middle. Yes, yeah, yeah. Why do you, what, do you think, um, I mean, um, I, I met a, a VC in, Berk, in um, SF once, and I said, so would you ever invest in companies, say, in London or something? And he said, well, I've got a company in Berkeley, but that's 30 miles away. Yeah. Um, why, it, why do they have that attitude? Um, yeah, I'll talk to why they do and why I don't. Um, I mean, at the end of the day, the reason VCs don't want to go do it in Silicon Valley is because, yeah, they're not comfortable, right? They have so many deals coming through. Like, I mean, if you sit there in the valley, people come to you from all around the world, right? And so you see so many interesting things. You're like, why would I move my ass anywhere, right? I mean, if I'm in the valley, I get so many meeting requests, some people coming to me that it's almost overwhelming, right? So if you want to just stay in focus there, it's very easy and you're going to see everything. And what's also really cool about Silicon Valley is like, now you're going to see the best US deals, you actually see a lot of international deals coming through because, I mean, everyone flows through there. It's kind of like you make a pilgrimage there. So yeah, a lot of the US investors don't feel the need to do that. So um, that's why I'd say most of them actually never leave the valley, so. So anyway, look, looking at your career to date, now you um, have been doing things since like the late 90s, early 2000s. Um, you were involved in some of the earliest um, startups like, uh, and the creator in fact of some of the earliest mobile startups like Metro, um, which came out at the same time as Dodgeball for instance. Um, well, you, I mean, you obviously felt you were a little bit early with that idea. No, I mean, that's a problem with tech startups. You never know if you're too early, right? I saw trends coming at the time that I thought kind of would overlap, and I thought for sure that, yeah, you kind of combined social networking with local, with mobile, that 2004 would have been the right time. Little did I know the company I created didn't start becoming really possible until now, and I see it now in a company called Tinder, and you're like, wow, it was 10 years too early, right? And then also, you could be too late sometimes, right? So the key thing is, though, keep on trying, keep on putting out there, and hopefully raise enough money where you go out there and build enough you know, runway, I guess you would say. But yeah, I mean, to have had a 10-year runway, that'd have been impossible, right? But yeah, so sometimes you do end up failing because you time things improperly, but um, you also learn a lot, and actually a lot of really amazing things came out of that as well, too, but you don't know that also in the beginning. You have to kind of connect those dots going backwards of sorts. But there's a sort of irony here, isn't there? Because, for instance, I uh, meet companies, uh, say, in the Middle East, who are doing things that I saw a few years ago, but actually, in this market, they can get traction because they're, they're relatively new ideas still. I mean, actually, that's one thing that's really cool about emerging markets and places that are, you know, aren't the Silicon Valley. You go out there and you could take business models that worked in other parts of the world and actually, you know, I'd say localize them or tropicalize them as we call that. So it's almost de-risking a lot of the investments. A lot of people actually get kind of mad about the copycats and all the people kind of cloning businesses. While I hate when people are doing 100% cloning of a company, I think actually there are opportunities for entrepreneurs in these regions to go out there and learn a lot by copying a business. And maybe that first business will be a clone, it won't be so big, but what gets me excited is that it's starting more people becoming entrepreneurs, and some of those people might go on and start a second or third company, and they'll be way more better of an entrepreneur. So I actually think that's actually a very good development for emerging markets to go out there and have people start companies. In general, the more companies being created, that means also more failures, but there'll obviously be more successes. That's better for a whole region. So I just encourage people to just start doing stuff. But just do anything. Doesn't, just, just, doesn't, just get going. I mean, like, get going. when I started my first companies, I had no idea what I was doing. You just make up shit. Everyone's making up shit the whole way. I mean, like, you're just figuring it out, but then you look back at five years from now, you're like, oh my God, I actually, now I'm the expert in my field because you went out there and you, you know, kind of learned by, you know, bumps and bruises. It's kind of like when you're walking as a kid, you don't just magically start walking. You have to fall on your face a hundred times. It's the same thing with running companies and becoming a good entrepreneur. You have to kind of get, you know, I guess, beaten up along the way to really become one that's good. Nobody comes out perfectly every time. I have not seen that. If it happens, then maybe it's some, who knows, God reincarnate, I don't know. Um, 
the atmosphere in Silicon Valley right now is very bubblish. Would you not agree? Yeah, I mean, things are definitely very hypey right now. Um, but what's the difference between now and then, you know, in the past is that there's actually really great numbers behind these companies. I mean, I see some of the growth, and I'm sitting there like, holy shit, these, like, companies are really growing properly. There's actually, you know, revenue coming in. It's not just eyeballs or some kind of fake metric. There's actually people going out there and actually making money. So it is getting hypish. The valuations may be a little bit higher than they should be, but um, I think it's justified, like, 80%, 90% of the way. Um... Do you think that's why um, people are looking outside the valley now because of the, I mean, you, see, you can't buy a house, get rent an apartment unless it's in San Francisco anymore, unless it's for a, less than an enormous amount of money. So yeah, I mean, do, is it that craziness, is that forcing people to look outside? I think it's one of the factors. Of course, people are like, hey, it's very competitive here, and if you're like Sequoia, Benchmark, et cetera, you'll get all the best deals, but maybe if you're like a lower tier VC, it might be a little bit harder. But there's also a couple other things. Um, I mean, we're seeing in all the regions around the world, be it you know, Asia, be it Africa, be it South America, the amount of like mobile penetration, the amount of you know, users that are coming online, the amount of new payment systems coming in, these things didn't exist five years ago, but now these are being slowly developed more and more. So there's opportunities to go out there and build really huge businesses, right? I mean, you go and market like Brazil or Indonesia, and there's hundreds of millions of people that have never actually had anything sold to them ever. You could go out there and be the first point of contact. So there's a lot of really huge opportunities. And in the next five years, there's going to be people that are going to go out there and like become those regional players, right? And it's kind of a greenfield new approach, right? And I think that's a really exciting time. And that's why I'm jumping on a plane all the time, because I want to go out there and be part of those big companies and own a small piece of them, hopefully. So, yeah. I would assume that... Um it's really it's the mobile phone that's driving all of this growth, isn't it? Yeah, I mean, it's definitely that, right? I mean, so first, first it was, you know, just regular phones, people kind of getting on. But yeah, like, the smartphones have come down so much in price. Like, in Africa, you go out there and buy a phone, it's a $100 smartphone nowadays, right? From a company called Techno, right? Like, it's amazing what's coming, and it just keeps on getting lower, right? So, um, yeah, it's amazing the penetration of these devices, and that really changes how people go out there and think and the type of, you know, products could be built and also, you know, what kind of investments you could do on top of that. Um, I mean, is that, give us, a lot of people here would be quite interested to hear your, your view on uh, how collegiate this investing is in, in the U.S. I mean, for instance, you might, um, do, you know, do you ever kind of have coffee with Dave McClure from 500 Startups or? I never do it in San Francisco, but we bump into each other in random cities all around you the see, world. You see yeah. him in other cities? Yeah, of course, that's kind of how it is. Yeah, me and him are never at home. So, yeah. uh, is everyone in San Francisco a big friend of each other or are you constantly competing? Um, so it, it depends on what level. If you're in a seed level, kind of like you're writing angel investor, 25 to a couple hundred thousand checks, Everyone hangs out because you actually syndicate all the deals and you're like, hey, I'm going to do this. What do you think this? Hey, could you jump in? That type of happens. But, but once you can start writing in your three, five, ten million dollar checks, it's a winner take all type of thing, right? So you are friendlies or kind of like frenemies. You're like, but people definitely have like, you no know, bitterness and sometimes people are on the boards together to hate each other. I mean, that does happen, right? But on a lower level, it's super buddy and people are super plugged in and everyone knows everybody, right? Especially at the cream of the crop. So, and um, they, I mean, as an observer of ecosystems around the world yourself, you would therefore say that um, at the early stage, people are syndicating deals amongst each other and gradually sort of bubbling everyone up yeah. through the pipeline. Well, I mean, the U.S. is really good at that. I think that's actually a problem with a lot of the emerging markets, that people are even fighting at the lowest of levels. Like, they're fighting over being the king of a small pond. They're like, I want to become the coolest guy in this region. It's like dude, there's nothing here. You guys should grow it together and grow the yeah. pie, right? So sometimes you see kind of bickering and bitterness at levels that shouldn't be happening, right? And, um, Over tiny amounts of money. Yeah, it's ridiculous. So, um, and that actually makes me sad. Are people like being way too protective and kind of almost like, you know, cutting people off the kneecaps in these regions? Like, I don't know why they're doing that. They should be helping each other out because it's so nascent and beginning in these regions that, yeah, they need all hands on deck. And I'm seeing some countries do an amazing job with that. We were just in Finland, right? Helsinki, like, Everybody there helps each other out, right? But there's other countries, and you, yeah, you see people just kind of totally fighting, and you're like, why are they doing this? So, yeah. Um, what's the opportunity, do you think, for some a company uh, to go global from so someone like Lebanon? Uh, there's um, there's a quite a successful app out of here called Poo, which has done uh, like 100,000 downloads already or something like that, and it's, so it's, it's actually doing okay, and it's, but nobody, nobody actually knows it's from from Lebanon, no, no big deal. 
Um, how do you take a company um, that's doing very well and do, would you just like parachute them into the valley or what would you do with that? Yes, yeah, so actually some of our strategy with some of our investments is to bring them to the valley, some that we decide to keep out there. Um, so it really depends on what kind of company you're building. If you're a company that's like 100% app or like a video game, you don't need to be anywhere in the world. You go out there, you put it in the app store, you put it on Google Play, and you have instant distribution, right? So you don't have to actually have people on the ground. Uh, but there's certain companies, yeah, you have to go out there and you have to start kind of building networks into the U.S. You have to go out there and do marketing in the United States. And yeah, when we see a company like that in our, in our portfolio, we will actually help them come out to the United States, be it raising money from the United States, kind of holding their hands to all the various VCs, or even helping them start their first office, help them you know, hire the first biz dev guy, or sales guy, stuff like that. But it really depends on the market. Um, I'd say it also depends on you know, if, if the company's being built for that region. So we do a lot of investments in, let's say, marketplaces in Southeast Asia. It'd be really stupid to bring them to the United States because their whole business is to sell to the Southeast Asian market, right? So it's a one by one basis, but we, when we see the opportunity, we definitely try to bring them to the United States as soon as possible, way earlier than even you would think, because then there's, their brain starts thinking differently and they start having different goals as well, too. You like uh, being a bit of an adventurer, don't you? Um, <laughs> you have famously um, became a Colombian citizen recently in order to compete in the Moscow, win with the Sochi Winter Olympics. Um, that's a bit crazy, by the way, isn't it? Uh, yes, it is, yeah. but that's what actually entrepreneurs are all a little bit crazy. What, so. what, what happened? Why didn't all your portfolio companies get annoyed with you that you disappeared off the planet for a few months to, to, to train and become an, an Olympian? Yeah, I mean, so luckily in all my regions, I have really great partners, and they kind of understood that this is something that I wanted to pursue. But also, we did have rules set. Um, Companies could, you know, I would still engage with companies, but I only would engage with them was actually really big, kind of critical key company events. So the company's being acquired, they're raising a big round of financing, I would still engage. But I wasn't going to be doing as much day-to-day -day stuff. But ever since then, now I've been kind of really catching up and kind of overcompensating to try to make up for my time loss of sorts. Right. Um, but it, that experience, that sort of, you've got a, an adventure bent about you, you want to... You, you, you went to, you traveled across Russia and Siberian wastelands. I mean, do you, do you, does that inform what you do as an entrepreneur and as an investor, uh, or is it just something you just do for fun? No, I mean, it's risk taking, right? Being an entrepreneur is an adventure, right? You go out there and you see some crazy goal. Like, I want to go out there and run the biggest company in, I don't know, let's say logistics or microphones or something like that, right? And you see this shiny object. It's kind of like an adventure sees, hey, I want to go out there and climb to Mount Everest, right? Or I want to go out there and accomplish this goal. And along the way, you learn a lot of things. And whenever I do these projects, I usually don't know what I'm doing in the beginning. And I kind of, you know, go out there, educate myself and start practicing along the way, right? And training yourself, right? So I see being an entrepreneur, the same thing as being an adventure. You're going to take a lot of risks. You have a big goal. And then hopefully at the end, you accomplish it. Sometimes you do. Sometimes you don't, but uh, the, the key thing is also attempting along the way. The amount of things you learn, the amount of experiences you have are just so informative you know, for your, I guess, personal being, I guess. Um, you've got a couple of funds operating right now. So you're based in San Francisco. You have the Savannah Fund, which invests principally sub-Saharan Africa. Yeah, English-speaking Africa, pretty so much. So English-speaking yeah. Africa in Nairobi. Yes. Uh, you have the Golden Gate Ventures, which covers Asia. Correct. And you have IO, which is an SF, and that invested, well, I suppose the, the, probably one of the most famous uh, investments is Uber. Yes. Who are obviously helping us out while we're here. And Game Founders, and a kind of a yes, accelerator correct. aimed at games. Um, I mean, do you, do you, uh, I noticed the lack of a Middle East fund. Is that, is that why you're here? You're going to launch something I here? I mean, I'm open to ideas. Um, I mean, when I start these vehicles, it's more opportunistic, not necessarily like, you know, like I've got a game plan. It's like I find somebody that I really trust on the ground, right? So my model is usually I look to find one local partner, like a, you know, an actual partner in the fund that will be on the ground all the time. And then also I try to bring somebody with Silicon Valley experience and make them move into that region. So, yeah, I'm here. I'm looking to meet new people. If there's somebody that wants to start a fund together, who knows? Maybe we start one together. I don't know. Uh, in general, I want to go out there and just put as many smart people on the ground and actually help as many entrepreneurs start you know, companies. My goal is to have thousands of entrepreneurs bloom, right? I think it's an amazing journey, and I want as many people to kind of share that experience with me. So, yeah, if that means starting a fund in the Middle East, it's definitely something I'd like to do, yeah. Is there any synergy between these different operations? Um, yeah, actually, all the partners know each other. I throw retreats. 
Uh, we kind of, you know, actually have people talk to each other. They, a lot of the guys actually do know each other. So, um, yeah, I think there is a good amount. I mean, in terms of actual, like, companies, not as much yet. But also there's learnings. We're learning some regions that we're actually applying to other ones. Like, for instance, in Africa, we're doing a lot of stuff in kind of mobile payments. That's being, you know, kind of applied in other regions as well, too. So, yeah, I'm seeing some. But I think in time, there'll be a lot more. Um, you've obviously you haven't been here long, long, so I'm not going to ask you about your expertise about the Beirut market or the yeah. internet here because you, you, you're here to fact find and learn about it uh, as much as possible yourself. What do you? What are kinds of things that you look for when you look at uh, an ecosystem or uh, entrepreneurs generally? Uh, what are the, what are the kind of key things that you look for? Yeah, um, on the ecosystem level. And I mean, I, I do work with a lot of governments and this type of stuff. Like, I'm looking for a couple of things. Um, one, obviously, I want to find people at the highest level are excited, right? Because you do need to have some people you know, able to open doors, right? And when I say excited, not necessarily financially excited, but like willing to go out there and usher young people in and willing to kind of go in an extended hand. I've seen some countries that ask for this help, but it's more for political reasons. They just want to kind of inflate their egos and not really doing it because they care. So I want to see people who actually care at the top, right? And that, that does mean the presidential level all the way down, right? But then more importantly, I want to see like a really cool grassroots level, right? Um, I want to see actually the young entrepreneurs, they're actually going out there throwing events. They're actually meeting up with each other. They're actually sharing ideas instead of being all protective and stuff. If I start seeing nuggets of that, and like, it doesn't even take many of them, but there's a few of them, then actually it could be a really good sign because it doesn't take much to actually start a good ecosystem. A lot of these things are started by, you know, three to five people and then it snowballs, right? But it just takes a couple like super hardcore, like almost maniacal ringleaders on the grassroots level to kind of really get things going. And once you see that, then yeah. And then obviously here, I mean, this conference came together because there were a few maniacally awesome people, right? And so that's a very good sign in my opinion. Um, do you think, how much do you think entrepreneurs themselves should be involved? Um, do they, or should they leave all the events and the organizing up to other people? Well, actually, I think some of the best events are run by, organ, uh, by entrepreneurs, right? Um, we obviously need people that are kind of more, the organizer kind of conference types, but also some of the entrepreneurs that put together events are the most powerful ones. So I actually, when I was an entrepreneur, I would throw a lot of dinners, right? And I wouldn't invite anybody else besides other entrepreneurs. And we kind of would have these events maybe you know, 15, 20 people, but they were really great because you could share the most deep, most feelings. Being an entrepreneur is a hard journey, right? And so I kind of say there's, you know, there's Alcoholics Anonymous, there's entrepreneurs. We'd get together, we'd cry, or we'd celebrate each other's victories, but having those kind of small events is really important too. So yeah, you need all types of people throwing different types of events, different types of gatherings, and kind of you know, sharing knowledge with each other. Um, what's, um, what's, what's, um, what's kind of, Peaking your interest at the moment, what, what are you super excited about, uh, either in a particular company or a sector or, or a region or what? What do you what, what sort of gets gets, yeah, you, I mean, uh, like, gets you going? Uh, apart from cross country yeah, skiing. Got, apart from skiing, yes. Um, so, I mean, obviously, I, I do love emerging markets, right? And that's obviously we already covered that. But um, in terms of like new industries or kind of things popping up. Um, I'm super into kind of quadcopter drones. I think that's gonna be really cool. I just made an investment in one company there and I think that's gonna be a lot more interesting stuff happening in that space. Um, you like drones. Why do I like drones? Yeah, why do you like drones? I'm a nerd, I wanna play with them, right? But the thing is, the reason I say um, that's important is because one, all my smartest friends are playing with them, right? And actually a lot of things that start out as toys end up becoming not toys, right? The internet to a lot of people was a toy, right? Computers was a toy, right? I see these things that are toys, they kind of go out and evolve into really, really big things. And actually a lot of investors, they look at things like, oh, it's almost too late. If you are looking at something, you know, it's already kind of developed, you might have missed the biggest companies in that space. So um, yeah, I get really excited about it because people are playing with it and it's really brilliant people. Like my most nerdiest, awesome friends are really geeking out about them. Like, oh shit, I better pay attention. So um, yeah. yeah, that's kind of what I'm saying. Do you think it's a, it, what, gr groceries delivered by drones or, or the other, other things? I mean, everything from that to like, I saw a startup recently that's doing, you know, oil pipe uh, maintenance, right? Uh, to going out there and border security between US and Mexico. Weird stuff like this, like it's not only like, you know, but then also I just put one to a company, uh, it's called Air Dog. It's like for extreme sports. You put a device and it follows you actually doing like spline curves to make sure to film you so you mount a GoPro camera and then you could do amazing videos that are completely automated right so like there's a whole slew of things from entertainment to yeah really hardcore very specific industry stuff so yeah it's, it's exciting it's cool so anything yeah. else exciting at the moment um let's see what else obviously I'm still kind of really big into kind of cryptocurrencies um I think that there'll be a progressive country out there that like adopts it 
and that will really change things. Um, but in general, just fintech is being kind of reformed. Like, people really trusted the financial system until 2008. And ever since then, now people are like, whoa, something's broken here. Maybe there's a chance for me to go out there and build a business. So in all these emerging markets, I'm seeing huge companies that are gonna be started in fintech. You know, like the future of banking, the future of payments is being done right now. And I'm sure there'll be a big startup that comes out of the Middle East as well too. So um, finally, which um, nationality are you going to take on next? Uh, you've got Colombian citizenship, Polish citizenship, U.S. citizenship. What are the chances of getting I, a I Lebanese be, I don't know. What, what are the rules to become a Lebanese citizen? I'm all for it, right? So, yeah. Who you knows? heard it here first. He's joining the club. Yeah. Thanks very much, Paul. Thank you. Excellent.